We're so excited that you're here and want to say a warm welcome from wherever you are tuning in today. And at C3, we're all about creating new ways to connect and belong. So why don't you drop a line in the chat, say hello and find community. We hope you enjoy today's service. So this morning we're continuing on our Freedom Series. Uh, we started this last Sunday, I had the privilege of, of starting this series off, um, but today I'm going to hand you over to you in just a moment to an incredible couple who, uh, look, I just, I, where honour is due, always give it. Where honour is due, always give it. To love is to honour. And I want to take a moment to honour these two because, again, we're doing this Freedom Series in so many ways because, you know, people bring something to you. That's the beauty of the church. It's not about just what the pastors bring. It's about what we, the church, bring. And this couple in particular has certainly have brought an aspect to our church that I believe will see so many lives continue to be transformed to the point of freedom. And they've been uh, certainly uh, uh, being practitioners of seeing people set free for years and years on end. And to a large degree, they, what we're asking them to do is basically pour everything that they have. Well, we want them to pour everything they have into each and every one of us. Because the greatest gift of anything that you've learned is to pass it on. But it's not just the theology, it's the anointing of it. There are some things that the Bible talks about that are imparted. In other words, there's some things that come because you're in its environment, you're in the atmosphere of it. And if there's anything I love about these two is that they have given themselves to the atmosphere, the anointing of seeing people literally set free. And Sunday next week, we're going to feature some of the stories of at least a small handful of people who that's indeed been their experience. So I would like to take a moment to, so Pastors Walter and Anne are going to lead us this morning and continuing to help us in our journey of reflecting Christ of actually experiencing what Christ said, that he who is free is free. Come on, let's put our hands together on our pastors, Walter and Anne, as they come to share the Word of God with us this morning. Good morning. Hello. What, what can I say? It's all been said. <laughs> um, when you came in this morning, did you put your spiritual ears on? And did you put your spiritual eyes on? You wonder why I'm saying this. Well, the, the Apostle Paul was writing to the letter uh, uh, to the church in Ephesus in the first chapter of Ephesians, chapter 1, uh, sorry, verse 18. Pray all, I pray also that the eyes of your heart might be enlightened in order that you might know the hope which he, he has called you, the riches of his glorious, glorious inheritance in the saints. Now, Paul was a man who knew what he was talking about. Today we are, as we've been said, we are going to uh, continue in our freedom ministry. The word freedom can mean, can mean different things to different people. Especially in the world, it's like a big rubber band. Everybody tries to, to pull it as long as they can. For some it means no restrictions. Just do what you do, what you like to do forever. And of course, it's anarchy for others. For others, soaring in the sky is freedom. To be free of debilitating illness or disease or being free of financial, financial restraint means freedom for many. Now, some of our so-called freedom fighters that were f fighting for years in the jungles of South America, were fighting there only to impose a far greater tyranny on the people than they, they were trying to free than they had before. You might remember Cuba. 
But our guidebook, the Word of God, is quite a different teaching and concept for the believer of freedom. Jesus made it very clear in John 8, 31 and 32. If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Usually, it's verse 32 we're hearing. Do you know the truth, and the truth will make you free? But Jesus said something there before. If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. And he emphasizes that in other passages as well. In verse 31, Jesus speaks of embracing his teaching and then it, it becoming part of us. In other words, do, I do, do what you learn. Put it into practice. Verse 32, then and only then will the truth empower us to be free. The word now in this verse means more than just having head knowledge, which is the Western way of, 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 of talking about knowledge. But in the language of the Bible, it meant experientially experiencing. When I went to primary school, we were taught that a verb, you might, if you don't know what a verb is, you might have missed out on that one. Taught that a verb is a doing word. To know is a doing word. To have knowledge alone does not mean we have wisdom. It needs to be applied to the right time and the right situation. I like the Passion Translation uh, in these two verses, and I'll, I will read it to you. 8, 32, 31, 32. Jesus said to those Jews who believed in him, when you continue to embrace all that I teach, you prove that you are my true followers. For if you embrace the truth, it will release true freedom into your life. Significant. Sometimes it's so good to have various translations to get the real meaning out of it. But the topic I want to really speak to you about today are generational curses. Who has heard about generational curses? Okay. For those of you that don't know what that is, well, I'll explain it a little bit more. Sometimes we talk about iniquities in the bloodline or, iniqui or generational iniquities. In Exodus, Exodus 20, verses 3 to 5, is really our blueprint for this. And we want to read this here. You shall have no other gods before me, says the Lord. You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven, Above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sins of the fathers to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. This is the passage that is the blueprint for generational curses. And it speaks there in the older version about the iniquity of the fathers. Now, when God speaks about iniquity, it means sinful wickedness, perverted and twisted. So when God calls it iniquity, he me it means the family bloodline has been twisted and perverted for the purpose of God for his people. Some of you might have noticed that how in some family lots of things seem to be going wrong or make no sense. 
It is as though there's a constant problem with sickness, with disasters and calamities. In some families, you notice everybody is divorced. The spread of poverty hangs over whole family groups. Now, I want to go back and, and look at the Israelites because this was the law was written for them. It just later became part of us because we were grafted into that tree, you see. In, in Lamentations 5 and 7, Jeremiah the prophet records these words that were spoken in the marketplace. Now, this is 580 BC. Jerusalem had just been completely destroyed. The temple had been destroyed. Everything had been erased. So at 580 BC, the people still had a very good understanding what generational curses meant. They said, it says there in five, Lamentations 5.7, Our fathers sinned and are no more, and we bear their punishment. However, as we go on in the history and uh, in the time of Jesus, we read in, in uh, John 9, verses 1 and 2, had Jesus and his disciples saw a man blind from birth. And the disciples asked Jesus, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Now, for the Jews at that time, the answer was simple. Personal suffering was due to personal sin. You just blamed it on them. The understanding of general curses was no longer understood. Jesus didn't answer that question. He was concentrating on healing the blind man, bringing glory to his father, not establishing the man's guilt. Apparently at that time, some of the rabbis, you know, these uh, muddlers that used to absolutely uh, fog up everything in theology, some rabbis argued that the soul of the antenatal state could sin. Can you believe this? That the body in the womb of mum could sin before he was born. That was the sort of crap they were, <laughs> they were then arguing and discussing. Theology gone mad. Whilst their God is a God of blessing, the very fact is that generational curses on our family line can spoil what God has for us. It is important to understand how much harm Satan can cause. For most of us, it is too, isn't too hard to search our own life and our own sins and transgressions. We usually, we usually know our stuff, don't we? But to repent before the Lord it's rather more difficult to deal with the sins buried in our family bloodlines, the iniquities. Just think for a moment how the family line spread just in four generations. I'm one, okay? My mum and dad were two. Their parents, that's already four. And then from there it goes to eight. So in just four generations, the tree goes into eight people groups, you know, all different families. So it's not that easy to work out what your iniquity is in the family line. It becomes very difficult as the generations go. Some of you might want to ask, what's God our Father allowed the devil to mingle in our family bloodlines? Good question, isn't it? The trouble is, God, God, uh, no, it's not a trouble. The way it is, is God is a holy God. And he cannot overlook sin. If there's iniquity, iniquity in my general bloodline that has never been repented of, the devil, the legalist he is, will search it out. And you see, he has a legal right to that. And this is what I was a bit surprised about. And he has the legal right to attack the people that are now alive. 
Now, if you look down the generation of that particular family, we usually find that the affliction of the wicked one has been going on for a while, usually through generations. Now, I'm, the question we've got to ask, why has God has put this system in the spiritual realm to function like this? We cannot question him about it, of course, because he's God. In Isaiah 55, 8 and 9, God says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways your ways, says the Lord. For the heavens are higher than, for as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Anne and I were ministering to a lady some years ago, as she was telling us her story, and, and I noticed certain events of disaster and sickness repeated and were very prominent. I whispered to Anne, there's Freemasonry in the line. So when I... Is this still going? When I asked her about whether there was Freemasonry in her family, she didn't. She answered, no, she didn't think so. But two days later, she rang up and said, yeah, I've asked Dad, and he said, yes, in his family line is, is Freemasonry. Now, we inv immediately invited her, she and her, and her husband, to come and be ministered to and, 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 and get rid of all this stuff. Because Freemasonry, if you're not aware of it, is one of the most wicked cults that draws incredible curses on the families and people, you know, of these, of these men that were in there. I believe, friends, that most generational family lines have iniquity in their bloodline. But when, of course, we're only concerned with God's covenant people, believers. God's promise in Deuteronomy that he will bless those for a thousand generations who honor and love him probably doesn't apply to that many people when you go down the bloodline over so many years. However, his promise stands, doesn't it? Examples of praying for substitute repentance of bloodline cleansing Cleansing, we can actually find examples of that uh, in the Bible in Daniel 9, where Daniel repents for the sins and iniquity and iniquities of the people of Israel. So he identifies with the sins of, the, of, of his people and to ask God to move to bring his honor back to Jerusalem, his holy hill. The second example can be found in 2 Samuel 21, where King David had to repent and make, make restitution for the sins of King Saul committed 70 years earlier. Thankfully, God has shown us and led us to the answers. Over the years, we've developed the prayers to cleanse the iniquities of the bloodline without having to search endlessly for the actual iniquity committed. Sometimes, the Holy Spirit gives us the key words. The Lord has been powerful, uh, has been faithful to see people set free. And to him alone goes the glory. Thank you. Amen. Hi, everyone. So uh, what Walter is talking about, the things that can be in our lives and can be an irritant and a hindrance to us are actually things where we are born a victim. But I want to speak to you something uh, about now that it's not we're not a victim. These are things that we actually sometimes do and we can speak out, and um, there, are, there are thoughts that um, take us sometimes to a place where we shouldn't be, but it's our own doing. 
So I want to talk about the power of words this morning. In John 1, verse 1, it says there that in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and God was the word. So Jesus is the word. It says there in the beginning. So let's go back to the beginning. In Genesis chapter 1, we read, we see and we hear there that God actually uh, created words. He created speech as he created us, mankind. And in there at the time uh, when, when, God, when the, the earth was of nothing, um, God came and spoke to the word, to the earth. And the Lord said, let there be light. And it was. And sometime after, he said, let the land sprout with vegetation and breath seed-bearing plants. And it was. And then we read a little bit later on, the Lord said, let the earth bring forth creatures, living creatures. And here we see the amazing creativity of Almighty God. And so it's under the earth, on top of the earth, in the sea, in the rivers, in the sky, God's living creatures. And when I was a child, primary school age, I was fascinated by all sorts of little things. I loved catching little lizards and things like that. I grew up on a farm. Uh, and when we would have a day like yesterday, um, my twin brother and I, we would uh, go down to the barn. We had a huge barn full of hay and we would go there and build forts with the bales and do all sorts of things down there. We had lots of fun. And every now and then there would be a plague of mice and we'd just move a couple of bales of hay and there they would run and they'd run in all directions and you couldn't catch the big ones. But sometimes we could catch a little one. And I remember having this tiny little mouse in my hand and I was just amazed. Just look, look at the size of the ears. Oh, those beautiful little eyes. Like the sweetest little creatures. And I let it go. Unfortunately, the ones my brother caught didn't, didn't have much life left. <laughs> he said they're a nuisance. We shouldn't have them here. <laughs> anyway. But yeah, so he made these tiny, tiny little creatures that we can admire and, and the creativity behind it all. Like God's creativity went off the chart when you imagine about it. You know, he created then larger animals. He, he created the, you know, the horses and the other animals. He, he created a horse-like animal and he said, let's paint it black and white and we'll make it a zebra. And then he thought, I've created this thing. We've got all this vegetation. And look, some of it's way up there. Let's stretch the neck here and get make a giraffe. Like, I just, I'm fascinated by all of this. The elephant with his great big ears. Does that mean he hears any better? I don't think so. I don't know. But I think God had a lot of fun. And after he'd made all of these living creatures and the other things that he had made, he had spoken into being. He said then, let us make man in our image. Let us make man in our image. Who are the us? This is God Almighty in three. Father, Son and Holy Spirit creating together, agreeing together. And they wanted to create a being that they could be in relationship with so that you and I can be in relationship with him. God spoke all of these things into being. And it says in the scripture that even the angels hear his voice and instruction and hear his word. In fact, the whole universe is made to respond to the voice of God's word. The whole universe is made this way. All of creation, all of God's creatures on earth are to reproduce, to multiply. All the living creatures, all the plants, everything's made to create and multiply. 
And God spoke these things into being and things were multiplied by his word. And I want to suggest today that we can plant words that are like seeds as well. We can create an atmosphere that is fun and joyful and beautiful, but we can create an atmosphere that is angry, that is stiff, that is poor, that is uh, threatening. And so we create with our words. Jesus, when he was here on the earth, his word was so powerful and the, the word, word the, the, the gossip, the, the information got out there that wherever he went, hundreds, no, thousands followed him. They wanted to come and hear his words. And because we are created in his image, our words are extremely important to God and to us. And near the end of his life, um, Jesus spoke this. He said, um, uh, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth in Matthew 28 and 18. Now go in my authority and make disciples of the nations. Jesus is saying, I give you whom you who I have become in relationship with authority to speak out in my name and command things to happen, to command, to plant seeds, to plant seeds, word seeds in and around people's lives. So we plant these seeds. We plant these seeds uh, over others and we plant them over ourselves. We create destiny. We create future for ourselves and for others. In Matthew 12 and verses 34 to 37, this is what is written. This is Jesus speaking. And he's speaking about how we, our lives, need to produce fruit. We produce good fruit or we don't produce fruit that's not so good. And this is what he said. He was talking here to, the, to his own people. Blood of vipers. How can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A good man, out of the good treasure in his heart, brings forth good things. And an evil man, out of the evil treasure in his heart, brings forth evil things. But I say to you, every idle word man may speak, they will have to give an account of on judgment day. By your words, you'll be justified. By your words, you'll be condemned. Very, very strong stuff. Out of the heart, out of the abundance of our heart, the mouth speaks. So what is in our heart is what we speak. It's what we believe. Verse 36 was... Uh, part of that um, that we read there, every idle word out of our heart. We will need to give an account. Proverbs 18 and 21 says that in your tongue and in my tongue is both life and death. True, huh? So true. Our words sentence us. They sentence us to what we say. We put ourselves down, we condemn ourselves. When you see something that's happening good and you see many people experiencing something good and then you say, oh, that would never happen to me. And a couple of days later you say, oh, that would never happen to me. You're speaking into being that it won't happen. We speak those words. That's how God's created us. Our words speak that and where then it doesn't happen. It'll bring fear and not victory. Too many pieces of paper here. In fact, we will only prosper to the level we agree with God's purpose for us and obey him. There's our prosperity. How well are we doing? We're doing as well as we agree with God's purpose for us. He tells us things that he needs to do. 
in the Word, in the Bible. I've left mine down there on the chair. But in the Word of God, there are instructions for us. It says love one another. Go the extra mile. Bring your tithes into the storehouse. Um, be, tell us to be kind, generous. He tells us we are more than a conqueror in him. So we need to take these promises and these words of God and put them into our lives and live them and live from them. If we um, have thoughts, something like this, whatever can go wrong probably will. We have we build a belief system and out of our belief system we then live. So in uh, there's in the book of in the book of James, James wrote some very good things, and I'd like to encourage you to to read the book of James, particularly chapter three. I'm not going to put it up because it's quite long, uh, but in chapter three, there the first ten verses, uh, James is talking about how um, a boat can be steered by a small rudder. It's just got this small rudder on it, and a large boat is steered by the rudder, whichever way it's taken, the boat will go in the direction. A horse is steered by a bit in its mouth. Just this small piece of, of, of metal rod, this rod that you put in the mouth and it's attached, attached to the harness and the reins and it's just a little tug and the horse will go in the direction that you want to go. Is that right, Megan? Okay. So, and, and then it says in that same passage, it said, but there's something that can't be tamed unless it comes under the power of God, and that's the tongue. Our tongue needs to be tamed by the power of God. It gets us into trouble, or maybe it doesn't. <laughs> okay, so um, I want to read us just a few little things that I've been I've found and some interesting little articles here. There's a pastor in South Korea and about even 10 to 15 years ago he had the largest church in, in the world with about 30,000 members. Uh, it's uh, Chong Yi Cho, Dr. Chong Yi Cho, 100,000 now, million now, a million people in your church. Wow. Just imagine how the staff, big staff, goodness. <laughs> yeah, so he's an amazing, amazing preacher. He's written a lot of books. He's written a lot of things. And he's written on – I found an article where he wrote uh, and he's I'm, – I'm going to have to read some of this because I'm not medically trained in any way whatsoever and a few things here. So this was a neurosurgeon, neurosurgeon in his church and they sat down one day to have lunch and he said, oh, you know what, we've got some things. This is about five years ago apparently. Uh, some new breakthroughs that they discovered concerning the mind and the power of words. And the neurosurgeon told him that they discovered that the speech centre of the brain affects all parts of the body. The speech centre of the brain. It even helps control the nervous system of an individual. The neurosurgeon explained to him if someone says, I'm weak, I'm insignificant, every cell of their body receives the message, it's time to be weak. The entire nervous system and all the cells to be prepare them, begin to prepare themselves to become weak. And then the central nervous, the central centre, the, the, the words that are heard, act on the voice. They begin to act to adjust the attitude for weakness and weakness begins to set in and flow into the body. Um, if someone says, I can't handle this, I'm a nobody, they end up being that. It's very, very important what we label and who we label and how we label even our children or label others because these words ha can have power. So he said, goes on to say, research shows that if we speak negative words or have negative thoughts, the brain releases a chemical that begins to penetrate the whole being. And this chemical is a hormone and it's called catabolic hormone. And that catabolic hormone is released into our system as we start to criticise or to speak out negative words and we, that will then infiltrate us. Um, 
and catabolic hormone is a chemical. Okay. If you continue to speak them, you can actually become very sick. You can change your mood. You can all you want to do is sing the blues. Uh, if you want to meditate and think uh, upon all and confess how bad everything is and uh, how bad we've got it, you actually can make yourself very depressed. Depression can set in. On the other hand, if you start to use positive words and speak positive things out over yourself and out over others, the hormone that released there is an anabolic hormone. So catabolic is negative. Catastrophic, I suppose, comes from there, I don't know. Anabolic, I'm just put, I'm just thinking, thinking aloud here. Uh-huh. So anabolic hormone, when that's released, you speak words that are positive, words of faith, words of healing, is released in the whole body. And with the flow of this hormone, the cells begin to feel better and are uh, uh, energised. Now, the anabolic hormone is released during two specific occasions in in an enormous way, and one of them is when we laugh. So if if you've got good laughter and you see funny things and things, laugh, laugh out loud, laugh as much as you can. It releases this positive hormone which helps us to build positiveness into our own lives and we'll see positive things around us. And the other one is when we sing especially when we sing praises. So sing praises that build people up, but particularly when we say praises to God. And apparently this is why when we come into church, when we leave church, we often go out saying, I feel good. You feel good because you've released this hormone has been released in the body. And so uh, to sing praises and to, um, to, to laugh is very, very healthy. And a good thing to do. I was reading a a little article and it was from um, Dr. Mark Sharona and he writes, The trajectory of your life and your destiny is inseparable when words that begin in your heart flow flow from your lips. To be very aware of the words you utilize to describe your emotional state. The way you, f- you label and describe your emotions have a profound effect on the outcome you actually experience and the way you look at others. So there's a lot of research gone on in this place. Um, I was very interested when I, and I kept this article because it interested me, I read um, a pastor in the, in the States who um, also has a very large congregation and he has a, um, a, a heart surgeon. In, in there and, and they'd got together the, the, the couple of couples and were talking about it and sh- uh, the pastor was showing some interest in the work of the sh- surgeon as he talked about bypass surgery and he's saying you know it's just plumbing he said you just got it all open there and you look to see where the blockage is in this artery and he said you get you look and you see you get a vein out of another part of the body and you just poke a little hole and you put the vein in there and then you come past the blockage and you put the vein back in in there and he said, it's just miraculous, you know. And I pray, I just love the way God guides my hands. And he he showed such a lot of interest. He said, hey, listen, would you like to come one day and we'll rig you up and you you can observe, if you like, when we're doing some surgery. You won't be able to say anything. You have to be really in the background. But you'll be able to see what happens. So who wouldn't? Some people probably wouldn't want to go. But anyway, this guy, he said, this pastor said, yeah, I'd like to do that. That sounds just so amazing. So there he was and there was a triple bypass being um, performed and uh, everything went smoothly and at the end the heart-lung machine was being turned off and the heart started to beat again and they could see the blood flowing through the, the, the vein, the bypass, going around the blockage and... And, and everyone was delighted. It's a huge staff, a huge lot of people, a little bit of chitter-chatter, and the atmosphere was good. And then he said uh, there was a second operation. He said, you can stay on for this one if you would like to. And he said, well, if I'm permitted, I'd love to. And a similar situation, of course, different patient, different age, and um, same procedure and a uh, little chitty-chatty amongst the people. Almost, he said, I felt like saying to them, pay attention there. 
do you, watch what you're doing. You're all a little bit happy here. And they said then it suddenly went very quiet. We thought, oh, what's happening? And then he realised that as they finished the procedures that the heart had actually not responding as they tried to take the heart-lung machine off and that they were needed to do something. So they got saline and warm to keep the heart warm apparently, tried to massage the heart and uh, the, you could feel in the air, you could feel in the atmosphere the concern that was there. And then the surgeon just stood still and he said, I knew he was praying. He said he stood still and then he walked up to the head of the patient and he leaned over to the lady and he, said, he spoke into her, ear, into her ear and he said, Mary, tell your heart to beat again. Mary, tell your heart to beat. And suddenly, boom, 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 the heart beat. How marvellous are words. How powerful are words. Amazing. I'll just um, want to start, uh, finish with another little story, something quite different. Um, in the 18, 18 middle, in, in the eighteen hundreds, uh, a lot of immigration from Europe took place to the United States, and a family, a Dutch family, immigrated to um, the United States. And Edison's were their name. And in eighteen forty seven, their seventh child was born, and they named him Thomas. Um, so when Thomas grew grew big enough, he could he wanted to get off to school. Everyone else went to school. He had six um, brothers and sisters, so he'd seen what happened. So he wanted to get off to school. And when he was in school, the teacher wasn't coping very well with him, and apparently uh, it didn't seem to be paying attention. And he would get annoyed with him, and he said, you, you, "You're disabled. You've got a disabled brain." Like that's really a terrible thing to say. But the boy went home and talked to mum and he said, the teacher said that I'm disabled. Mum went to talk to the teacher and he said, look, he doesn't pay attention. He's all over the place. Uh, I can't get him to concentrate and uh, whatever else that she complained. And so mum decided that she would take him home and homeschool him. Was she a school teacher? No, she wasn't. But she had six children that had already above the levels that he was in. So she knew what to do and what to teach. And she started to encourage him to sit and to do the, do what she was putting in front of him and then to encourage him and speak words into him. You can do this. Look at that. Ten out of ten here. Look at that. Only one mistake. That's amazing. You can do this. You're going to be a great scholar. Speaking into the child... And uh, we know that this man became an inventor. And he invented many things, actually. But the most uh, uh, amazing thing, of course, that he invented and he's known for, Thomas Edison made the light bulb. Now, this is not that long ago. When I was thinking about this, he's born in 1847 and died in 1930, these are the years as my father in, in, was born in the, in the 1960, 1860s. So my grandfather actually grew up without electricity because electricity was just coming into being then. So my grandfather, my grandparents grew up without electricity uh, in their early years. I don't quite know when electricity came to um, be here, but here on the northwest coast it was quite early because I know that I was born on Tasman Peninsula and there was no electricity on Tasman Peninsula when I was a small child. So, you know, this invention, how many hundreds and hundreds and thousands of years went with people who didn't have electricity, just oil lamps and kerosene lamps and candles. But the invention that this man was able to do and leave us with light, physical light in our homes, in our businesses, on the streets, everywhere else electricity is, is, you know, will never be forgotten. Thomas Edison is a fa famous name. But I want to suggest to you that there's a more famous name and that is Jesus. And he put, switches on the light inside of us. 
he comes and puts the light through his love and through his presence into us. And if, I'm just wondering today if there's anyone here who has actually not yet switched the light on. If there's anyone here this morning, you've not switched that light on. You've heard about it. You want to have that light on. The presence and the love and the power of God that is available to you needs to be switched on. And by the power of God's presence, it can be switched on. So I'm just going to ask us right now, if we'd all like to just bow our heads and close our eyes and give privacy to all those people that are around us. And I'm going to ask then, is there anyone who would like today to receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Saviour and invite him into their lives and switch that light on, switch the light of the love and the power of God? We've got anyone who's um, not yet done that and would like to have that and would like to be able to know that you can speak God words over your family, over your children. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Got some recommitments coming. Lord God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Okay, so I'll just we'll um, pray and uh, ask if it's, uh, let us re repeat this together so that uh, those who have been touched this morning with this and want to be free and want to reignite the light in their lives, it will happen today. Let's say this together. Repeat after me, dear Lord God. I acknowledge that I am a sinner. I've been away from you and I need to come back. I repent of my sins. I ask you to forgive me. I accept that you died on the cross for my sins. Lord Jesus, and that you rose for me. I invite you into my life now. And I want to confess you as my Saviour and Lord. Guide me in the way I should go so that I might live now on for you. Hi, church. So good to see you guys online and right in front of us in church in the service at the moment. We've got yeah. some announcements going on. So yeah, so this lot. week have birthdays we have phil handy and zoe rose who's turning the big 18. Woo! happy Woo! birthday to both you guys we also made a mistake we missed someone's anniversary it was scott and margie kelly's wedding anniversary and we missed it so happy anniversary to them um and if we don't have your details we might miss on your birthday or anniversary so we don't want that to happen so go to the service desk at the back or follow the link below and we can Make sure that we have you in our system. And while you're at the service desk, right at the back, you can sign up for our Freedom Ministry series, which is so awesome. Um, the next one will be next Sunday, so sign up so you can be involved in that. Yeah, we also have Vulture Juice on tonight. We've got our Mario Kart night. Woo! How exciting. So excited. So be there. Yes, can't wait. And last but not least, if you haven't registered for our church services, Please do that so you can come along and be with us, be with our family, um, and it'll be great. So you can do that through the link below, and yeah, can't wait to see you soon. Bye! Thank you so much for joining us online at C3 Church Devonport today. We hope and pray that your experience with us has been a very memorable one Come and on. a great one. So um, if you want to find out more about who we are as C3, honey, 
How can they do that? I'm glad you've asked. Hey, we'd love it if you would join, on, jump onto our website, www.c3churchdevonport.com. Here you'll be able to find a link to what go towards our online page, which is somewhere you could, if, particularly if you're new to us, uh, we'd love to hear from you, love to know that you're watching and be able to connect with you. Or maybe today you've made a decision for Christ. Yeah. Again, we would love it if you would connect with us, that again, go to our website. Uh, you'll see a, a, quite an obvious link uh, about connect. You've made a decision to follow Christ. Love it again if you would just fill out that form, connect with us, and we'll, we'll yeah. get in touch with you within the next 24 to 48 hours. So good. So thank you for joining with us again here online. If you yeah. live here near in the Devonport area, we would love to host you. We would love yes. for you to come and come experience who we are at C3. Yes. Um, but again, if you've got any other questions about who we are, mm -hmm. please feel free to jump onto our um, Facebook site yep. and send us a message and inbox us and we'll uh, yeah, start a conversation through you. that. Yeah, so good. Have a fantastic week. God bless. Bye.